about it. Let's just try that again and say welcome again to the show. Had a little bit of a sound issue there, but listen, welcome to the show. Hopefully everybody's going to be hearing this right now as we're going on here. And uh, welcome to Take Stock Live. This is just turned noon here. My name is Sam Evans. I am here with you on the show. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the markets. And we're joined by a very special guest as well, Merlin Rothfeld, who I've been working with on for many, many years and been a guest on his show as well uh, many times. And I'm excited because he's going to be a guest on my show. If you were just looking at this live and you just saw my lips moving but not hearing anything, we had a slight technical issue there. This is live, but we look like we have it fixed and everybody's typing in here. I can hear you now. Thank you, Louise, Daniel, Graham, and all you guys for making me informed. This is the great thing about live radio, though. You know it's live when we do it like this. So let's start all over again from the top. My name is Sam Evans, and I am the host of Take Stock Live, and it has just gone noon here on the East Coast on Facebook Live. And if you are joining us live, uh, you'll be able to type your questions in as we go. Uh, let's get over to uh, looking at where we are right now. Top things in the headlines right now. Again, as we were just saying on here, S&P 500 looking fairly strong. Let's bring up the charts right now and do a quick rundown on everything where we are for today uh, on the charts at the moment and just see where we are. So uh, right now on the markets on here, looking at S&P up at 384.82, just under $3 up on the day right now as well. So a steady-ish kind of day as well. Uh, Apple having a semi-similar day at $2.16 up for the day as well. Uh, uh, $1.92 at $382 a share on the QQQs. And the Russell, which has been the absolute powerhouse of us late, having a good strong day again right now uh, at $4.28 up to two eighteen on the day as well. Um, Amazon has been the talk on a lot of things as well right now as well. And uh, what we're going <laughs> to... Already typing in, it's going to be the meme show or the miming show. I know, thank God I'm a little bit more animated on here. Listen... I will make sure that no one mutes you when you come on in just a minute, my friend, as well. Going on to here, Amazon, $3,317 right now on the day. Uh, just under $6 up right now. Doesn't seem like the step down of Jess Bezos, Bezos has affected that one slight bit. I mean, listen, the man's a visionary. He's done great. Does it really change the company? I don't think so. No reason to see anything kind of selling off hard uh, in that. And just steady as she goes as well. Kind of a flat day right now. What else are we looking at? Gold right now on the day. Uh, GLD, the contract here at 167. Just under four bucks down on the day as well. Uh, again, I would say kind of a lackluster day. I always get a little bit of a feel for this by literally going to the charts themselves. Let's go take a look at the SPY right now and see what we can see on here. Uh, and you can see the day on here on the four hour charts. I'm going to go to the daily charts to take a little bit of a look at this But on the daily charts. You know, it's up for the day testing what I would say uh, a major kind of resistance area right now around the 385. But it's kind of been business as normal on here. Just literally pull back cities as this market has moved forward on here. So now just looking at this chart, you know, to me, the uptrend is still in place on here. Would I want to be a buyer at the market right now? Absolutely not. But no reason to really suspect that this market isn't just going to pop through and make a few new highs uh, once again on the day. Any other major factors that are driving news today? Let's take a look on here. Uh, really in the talk of the news as well is Ken Frazier is going to retire as the Merrick CEO at the end of June. It seems like all the CEOs are stepping down. Zuckerberg being literally the last of the old guard, Rouse, old guard now remaining CEO uh, at Facebook. Uh, Apple and Hyundai Kai pushing towards a deal on the Apple car. Rumors are saying around 2025 uh, they're looking to unveil that. I'm already saving my pennies, being the Apple fiend that I am. I'm excited to hear about that. But 2024 production, 2025 release to the public, they do like to push the price up on things. So let's just wait and see what the price of that's going to be. I wait, and I'd love to hear Merlin's take on that in just a minute as well. Uh, Klobuchar unveils antitrust reform that would impact big tech as well. U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar. And finally, Biden signs flexibility on uh, signals flexibility on the COVID, st uh, COVID stimulus as well. Uh, still wrestling over policy here. How much is going to be paid out? Stimulus checks, all that kind of stuff. Man, COVID is not behind us. But it feels at the moment we're talking less about it. But that doesn't mean we should not pay as much attention to it because it has been a hugely impactful thing uh, for many, many, uh, many, many people out there as well. And, um, you know, again, let's not forget it. Let's hope that this year definitely brings a more positive outlook and resolution to, to where we're at right now as well. So there's your markets right now. I mean, just a rundown to me, not a lot excited, you know, not really that excited by what I'm seeing. Uh, just a, like I say, a retest eyes to me. It just looks like it's been a decent pullback on here. But what I'd like to do is just jump straight into the content of today 
and start just talking about, obviously, my guest on the show. And before I bring him on, I'm going to say this right now. I, I've been saying constantly that I was going to have this great guy on the show, and I, I want to make it a regular feature if I can. And Merlin and I, we go way back. Merlin Rothfeld uh, and I go way back from our days in, in educating together, and we've made friends as well. And I thought it'd be really fun to have him as a guest uh, on my show as well. So without further ado, let's just see if he's there. There he is. He's beaming in live from California. Merlin Rothfeld, how are you, my friend? I'm great. I don't, I don't own a snow shovel, but I thought I would send you one. For <laughs> oh, my holidays. God. I think I just broke mine. I mean, I've used <laughs> it so much. I mean, oh, my God. It's, it's one of those lovely days, though, right now. I mean, you're a skier, right? You ski and spend time and all that. You know, in that lovely Actually, day. What... Skiing is for mortals. I snowboard. Yeah, well, there right. you go. You like to get out on the slopes. Let's put it that way. It's at that beautiful stage right now where it's settled. It's compacted. The sun is out. It's pure blue skies. There's nothing like that. I love the tranquility of snow. I just hate. I like when it falls. I like when it's now. It's the shoveling and all the rest of it that goes with it. I don't like too much as, as well. As the all-important Ice Cube had said, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. There you go. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. A great day to stay indoors. Though. How's the weather out on the uh, on the West Coast there, Merlin? You're joining us from California, right? We're, we're struggling. It's, it's a 63 degrees out here, a little bit of clouds. I just... You know, state of emergency, there's no sunshine. There you go. Beautiful weather. I know you keep trying to twist my arm to get me out there. I, I do think that this winter definitely on the East Coast has started to push me further and further afield as well. So I might be joining you sooner rather than later. But talking of pushing, Merlin, i got to get your opinion on GameStop, buddy, before we get into kind of what we were talking about. This whole thing, it seems to be everything all everyone's been talking about is GameStop. I want to bring up the charts right now so you can see them with me. Here we are right now. This is live, and I want to go to a slightly smaller time frame on here. This is the day chart. Let's get, you can see it on the just today. Another gap down on the market here. Uh, another push on the downside right now, at literally struggling. $67 a share. Could you see this coming, Merlin? Because me, I was so negative about this whole thing, and I have been the whole time. What's your thoughts on it, buddy? I didn't just see it coming. I shorted the stock. Oh, no, I shorted it. Yeah, <laughs> at 355 I bought a put. And, and I did it as an experiment, really. Mm -hmm. But if you know the fundamentals of a short squeeze and look at what happened with GameStop, it was the stupidest thing ever. And and I apologize for those of you who, who feel I'm being very condescending here. I absolutely am being condescending here because these Reddit traders, these Wall Street bets, idiots, these morons, they think that they exploited some little niche thing, like they created a short squeeze. Like it's it's a new revolution that they came up with. No, you idiots. We've been doing this since the dawn of financial markets. And ultimately what ends up happening in this situation, and if you don't understand it, then don't get involved. You are going to be left holding the bag, period. No, no institution. If I'm Goldman Sachs, I'm going to fire any trader on my desk who's buying GameStop at $480 when it's losing almost 5 bucks a share. I will fire you instantly for that. So I'm going to pull all my offers. I'm going to let that thing float up. Let these GameStoppers hold the line. Hold the line. Get Elon Musk involved. And all of a sudden, I unload my shares. I crush that thing back down. This should be back around $30 by the end of the month. Where it probably yeah should be i mean on a on a on a good day i mean or oh, say so on a good day i mean for me from a fundamental perspective i mean talk about a, a, an area of the economy that's going to feel the pinch rather than just being digital but that's what i've been saying to a lot of people before it's almost like no one's reinventing the wheel here you know and if it were that easy that a group of people could just get online and start pushing up stocks off we go now we heard we heard it earlier this week as well now silver merlin i mean mm -hmm. that was the last one as well silver let's go take a look at silver and uh, we had that. Now, apparently, they were trying to do it to, to silver as well. Let's go over to the chart so we can see. Uh, and silver, there was the pump that we saw on, on yeah. silver on my chart on the right-hand side, hitting highs of $30.21 today at twenty six nineteen. Well, I saw that move in silver, and I'm like, well, that's the commodities market. That happens anyway in the commodities market. Nothing yeah. new there, but I think you've got to have your big boy pants on if you're going to try and get into that, right, Merlin, and try and take on the big boys in a major commodities market like that. What are your thoughts there? Well, I think it's kind of ironic that you have the same group, which is saying, let's stick it to the man by doing a short squeeze on GameStop and pushing it up. They're now saying, oh, let's do it on uh, silver as well. Well, you know, Citadel is like the fifth largest holder of silver in the world. So here you are sticking to the man by making them billions of dollars by pumping up silver. Mm. Anyway, I mean, this is just a simple phenomenon that happens in the markets. Obviously, it's nothing new. Trey, uh, when I got started back in the late nineties, it was Yahoo chat rooms. We're doing the same thing. Right. What's what makes this one unique is the collective power of having so many people involved with it. But you know, this is a situation where 
fool me once, you know, shame on me, fool me, or fool me once, shame on whatever, how that stupid phrase goes. I feel like George Bush, I can't even remember that stupid <laughs> phrase. Um, the institutions are not going to sit there idly and let that happen all the time. Right now, if, if you're an institution and you don't have a monitor, meaning a, a spy in those rooms, not just watching what they're talking about, but also pumping your agenda, then you're, you're missing out on the boat. And I assure you that those guys are in there right now doing this to make sure that they have a say in what goes on with these pump and dump things happening in these Reddit rooms, Wall Street chats, Wall Street bets, whatever the case may be. Um, with silver, it's obviously much more difficult. I think the GameStop one was pretty predictable. You had 138% float, uh, 138% short interest. When you have that much short it's easy to pop this thing with a short squeeze. Um, with silver, I think it's a bit different. Uh, it was quick, to, interesting to see it come back down so quickly. I thought it would jump up and kind of hover and stay there. You know, I'm actually long term very bullish on silver. Yeah. The only the only negative side here is the U.S. dollar. The dollar index has been steadily building a base, slowly starting to rise up, and, I, and I'm I'm cautiously optimistic on that dollar to keep continuing moves to the upside. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you are still a little bit more bullish on the on the dollar again at the moment? You're saying. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky. You know because... how I've been about it. Every time I've been on the show, like, yep. it's like I, you know, but please go ahead. Give me, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, you know, if you bring up the chart there, you'll you'll notice that we've been in this this ugly downtrend for quite some time, and all yeah. of a sudden we've started to form a base. We've most recently started to make a series of higher lows, and, and you know, today's action is great because we're kind of breaking through a little bit, and it, it feels like that momentum is starting to build when you look at a, you know. Uh, maybe a daily time frame, kind of zoom in. It's it's making higher highs, it's making higher lows, it's breaking through some previous highs from a couple months ago. So I'm not saying you're out of the woods yet on the dollar, right? You can see that some might even call that an inverse head and shoulders pattern. And whatever you want to say, the pattern still reflects optimism in the dollar, at least for the better part of the past uh, month or so. Now, the grand scheme of things, we look at the larger time frame, which is where we should start. You know, it, it's obviously very weak. However, everything moves in one direction until met by an equal or opposite force. And, and I think that right now what we're witnessing is a little bit of uh, overpricing it in. I think that the, the knowledge that the Fed is going to be very accommodative, that we're going to get more stimulus, you know, that I think has been priced in already. Now, all of a sudden, I think it's the realization that, hey, we're sitting at this longer term demand zone. Yeah, you just mapped it out right there, that this might be that bounce point. Now, granted, we did something very similar a few months back. I think it was back in August on here. We did a similar... Uh, formation we started to make higher highs but uh yeah I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic on this one we'll see what happens at 92 that's kind of my line in the sand if we get above yeah. 92 then i think you got some good upside move in the dollar index which of course would hurt commodity prices absolutely and then again i look at this and i marked off the whole area where we see like price demand coming in a, you know, a support zone another way we look at it or, or call it as well I agree. To me, the tell here is that some strength. I wouldn't want to be fighting this right now. Let's just zoom into this section of the price action that we hear right now. Just so you can see, this is a weekly candle I'm on here at the moment. Everybody who's looking at home. This is unlikely we're not going to be closing higher this week. And a good close, close higher, you know, and then going over to this on the daily charts. Again, you can really see that a consistent level of closing higher. There's a nice little trend forming on that. Sure, we're going mm -hmm. to get some resistance. Sure, when we go to these time frames, we've got a little bit of a mess to deal with. But again, I think, Merlin, if we can actually get through something like this area that you mark, I just got to be looking at that big round number of 100 again off of there. And that will put pressure uh, on, on some of these other markets. It will put pressure on the commodities. It will put pressure on some of these as well. But again, you know, I think it's still, you know, the, the diamond in the rough for me anyway as well. Yeah, I, mean, I think if, when you, if you look at this picture, Sam, where you have the left side of that box, yeah. you're, you're right in the middle of a range where it did. It's almost the exact same picture yep. as what we're experiencing right now. Yep. It had that yep. slow sell off and started to make some highs. Yep. It broke out. Yep. And unfortunately, it just failed. You know, this this breakout could fail again. It could. And we but, need new know, buyers to jump in. But these are great times when you get this kind of sideways action that we see here where we can get that accumulation or this distribution. And what I do like more about it, Merlin, and, and not, it's not to interrupt you, is going out to these longer term time frames. And I'm going to go out as far as, let's see if I can hit a, you know this on here right now. You know, even if I go out to a monthly chart, I mean, let's go real big on this. I mean, this is a real key area. And while it was nice around here where that last bit of consolidation happened, to me, let's just clear this hole over. This is a very, if I zoom in on this section of the chart, this whole area is an incredibly significant price area, you know, where we had a lot of resistance, now a lot of price support. Technically, that is a better buying opportunity where I think that accumulation has got a better chance, you know, especially. Agreed. And I look at that monthly chart, 
And that's the tell for me. As you know, I'm a big chart kind of fanatic. I don't see anything until we really get up to here. Plenty of wide open space to just keep pushing up as well. It's not going to do it in a straight line, you know. Because yeah. as we no, know, it never does, does in a straight if line. it does it in a straight line, it's coming straight back down again, as we know. <laughs> go look at AMC. We should, <laughs> right? Go look at GameStop and all these things. But a great, a great outlook to have on here. I absolutely, I love it, Merlin. Let's talk. You, you mentioned over the years you've been doing this, and you know your, your your looks defy you, my friend. I mean, you know, it's you don't look like you've been doing it as long as you have. You know, obviously you've lived a pretty blessed life uh, with all of this. But I know no one enjoys the markets more than you. I, I wanted to kind of take this on, as you know, on this show here. You know, we love to talk about you know the markets and the, and the quality of life it can bring for some, and and everything that it does as well, as well as get a little bit technical too. Um, but, I, you know, I think what I found is getting feedback from the show is people love to just hear from traders, people who've been doing okay. this a long time. And, you know, it's so wonderful. I find myself, you know, when I, you know, I talk to somebody and I was looking at everything that's been going on in the news. I'm like, seen it all before, heard it all before. It's business as normal. Nobody knows that more than you. Marlene, how many years you've been active now? Tell us about where it started, because you've definitely seen a change. Or have you? Have you seen a change in how things happen from a technical point of view, but from a fundamental point of view of how you do business? I mean, let's talk about what your roots are and where you started out. Sure. Uh, I started back in 1996, but that was just kind of managing my own trades, looking at my own accounts, kind of doing longer term stuff. So that really wasn't the active short term stuff. If you look back to 1998, um, I kind of took a leap of faith. I, I was looking around for different schools that were teaching this technology called direct access trading, which is level two screen. So I looked in New York and Dallas and Southern California, ended up taking classes in Southern California. And from then on, you know, really kind of became an expert in a niche part of the market, which was direct access level two. Now you talk about technological innovations that's changed over the years, but I guess my roots of really short term active high speed trading came back in 1998. Uh, it's it's one statistic I love to throw out there, which people will freak out about, is back in the late 90s, 98, 99, I was averaging 550 trades per day. Now, most people aren't going to do that in a year. Um, it was just stupid at the time. It was just the way that you did things back then. Of course, I do not do anywhere near that. I might do a trade or two a day nowadays. I'm, you know, I'm doing so many other things. Um, but that was really what we did. And, and so, minute, what were you trading then? I mean, you trading a lot of tech stocks because obviously this was when the, the tech thing was really happening as well, right? Yeah, it was the dot com bubble. I mean, so, you know, back then we we're looking at Dell, Cisco, even even Amazon in its infancy back then was just such a wild, crazy stock to trade. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's interesting. One thing that I think really helped me and may help your viewers out as well. There's a a um, a, a way to analyze your trades. And, and a lot of people don't do that. And you should be looking at your trades and asking yourself, what do I trade the best? Meaning what asset class or even individual securities? So you'd be surprised if you trade stocks. You can go back through your list of stocks that you trade and you'll probably find one that not only do you have a higher success rate, but you're making more money overall with it. Whatever that stock is, trade that more right. and you'll find other stocks that you just lose money with or you just don't have a good success rate. Whatever that is, dump it, get rid of right. it. Who cares? So that was a tough one for me to figure out. And what I noticed was I went on these periods of about two years per company. I don't know why it was two years, but I traded E-Trade for two years. I traded um, Exodus Communications for about two years. I traded Broadcom for two years, Juniper for two years. That's eight years of my life where I pretty much just traded those four stocks all day long because I started to get their patterns. You have to understand that with institutions, JP Morgan's, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, they have a specific trader that will trade that stock. And I could almost see their patterns forming in the market, their actions and how they would process orders and start to use that to my advantage instead of just for their advantage. And the only way you get that is by focusing on something so intently for so long. Yeah. Uh, that to me was a competitive edge back then. What happened then when you started to, to, to change? How did you feel that you had to then change your style? you know, as, as things did change, because I mean, you know, level two, I, I remember when I very first started, so I'm going back 18 years now when I started and I was still on that back end of people were saying, Hey, level two is the way to go. Level two is the way to go. Um, I confused me if I, if I'm honest. And I kind of went over that. And then I was just like, you know, things change, change, things became more transparent and people were now doing it more from their homes. I was almost like, well, why, how, how can these big guys, these big market players, why, why would it be in their interest to give, to show me what they're doing now? You know, because I guess there were less people doing it back then, right? So it didn't really matter. Now with so many eyes on the market, I had to adapt and become just focused purely on price, purely on rules, purely on a methodology. What about yourself? You know, what was the, what was the next evolution for you then? 
Uh, for me, it really happened, I think it was 2001 when we went from fractions to decimals. Fractions created really wide spreads in the marketplace. Oh, yeah. So it was easy to sit at the bid, buy something, and immediately flip over to the ask and sell it and make a quick profit. But when that went from a teeny, which is 0 0.0625, it dropped from a teeny to one, uh, one penny. Right. So basically, the, the margins there were gone. So we kind of had to reinvent ourselves, which is a good thing because, to be honest, when you're trading that much and that all day long, it's extremely stressful. And not only is it stressful, but the amount of money that you paid back then in commissions right. was ridiculous. For example, I'd have a day where I made 10 grand, and you're thinking, awesome, I made 10 grand today. And I go to the back office and check my statement. It's like, oh, you made $1,500 after commissions. Like, what? $8,500 in commissions? Are you kidding me? So wow. you, know, you start to. You, you, you treat it like a business and I, and I, I had to adapt. Um, I went very quickly from that high speed, very active model to, you know, maybe making 20 trades a day. And then I wow. whittled it down now where I'm not allowed to make 20 trades in a week. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't if I want to, but I don't see the need. Um, and my, my attitude for viewers out there, which I think might help some of you is you should treat it like it's a sniper right, or a, a six shooter, right? You've got a six shooter, you have six bullets. Most people, when they're high-speed day trading, it's like you have an AR-15 with an unlimited clip and you just shoot at anything that moves. That will cause you a lot of grief. But when you when you tell yourself you have a limited amount of trades, let's say it's five trades or three trades or two trades a day, you'll start to focus more on, is this really a, a good trade? Because I can't waste the bullet. I don't want to waste my trade on something that's junk. I'm not going to you know, fly into GameStop and catch on to that FOMO. No, I'm going to look for something that's a real company that's moving uh, in a in more predictable manner. So to me, that's a pretty important piece that helped in my development along the way was putting a cap or a limit on the amount of trades that I could be making in a day. Especially with those commissions too. I mean, from a practical standpoint as well, um, I, I love the sniper you know, analogy as well. And I think mm -hmm. I put down trading and as you've seen the evolution, I think you know, there's these people who want to trade because you know they want to make some money. I mean, I guess you know, there's people who want to make a big money. They want to go down the track. That's what I look at. We go down the track, we have a bet, off we go. They make that money. And then there's people who want to do this in a sustainable manner. You are one of those people who've done that. You're like, hey, this is going to be my business. This is going to be my my income. This is going to be what I do now, for, you know, hopefully for the rest of my life. And you've you've made it a business to do that. And uh, that's 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 the like that's what I can relate to. It's like this is something that needs to be done every day because what always scares me about when I see these things, you know, these one off fads and I call them is anyone can go down the track and make a bit of money, you know, and, and bet on something. But doing that over and over again and you know, is a different thing. And that's why, you know, you're probably similar to me now. I just look at the same markets pretty much over again. I'm always looking, you know, for something else out there, but to go to the same well where I know it is. In our trade sessions, we typically look at the NASDAQ and the Russell, the S&P. That's it. That's all we look at. Yeah. Trade yep. those for income. And I always say this, I can completely relate to the picking my spots. You know, I say to the students, I say, I either nail the low of the day or I nail the high of the day or I'm completely wrong <laughs> and I have to walk away. You know, and I've yep. learned that the walking away psychology has been a big thing for me, Merlin. How big has it been for you over over the years as well? Like keeping yourself in check, because does it's your strategy probably the biggest component, does, honestly, because yeah, does your strategy really have to change that much if you've got a winning formula or is well, it your it's mindset? Hard to say if you have it's hard to say sometimes if you have a winning formula, I mean, you have to experiment things, try different things. But. You know, I, I, I tried to get a European uh, commission to give me money to do this study because I just don't want to do it with my own capital. Um, but the study was <laughs> like this. That? Now, that's a, a trader. I, that's a trader speaking there. Yeah. <laughs> Use other people's well, money. <laughs> I, I firmly believe that this is true, that if, if I was to take $50,000 and put it into an account and say, okay, I'm simply going to flip a coin. I'll pick a symbol. So stock XYZ, flip a coin. Heads, I go long. Tails, I go short. Right. Right. Okay. Tails, I'm going short. If that stock is in an uptrend, I can only trade 100 shares of it. Mm -hmm. If it's in a downtrend, I can trade 200 shares of it. So if it's in the direction of the trade that I'm going to be making, then I can trade double. Right. So if it, if it was heads and I went long, if it was moving up, I could trade 200 shares. Right. If it was right. moving down. So I don't want to buck the trend. Bigger, so bigger one, size the based on the trend. Right. Gotcha. Exactly. Yeah. So right away, I'm putting the odds in my favor. And then you have a three to one reward risk ratio built into that. I wanted to do a study because even with the most basic strategy like that, if you stuck to the rules 100%, pretty sure you're going to make money over time. Yeah. Now, of course, the human psychology allows us to break that. You know, I think the biggest challenge is human emotions. Um, at the very beginning of this, I was an extremely cocky, arrogant son of a bitch. And some people would still argue that I am. Well, Sorry, I knew you. I, I knew you a while ago. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm you not saying anything right now. <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, and I and so was I. So it's all good. <laughs> well, in, in your in, in, in our personal lives, it is what it is. But in yeah, the trading world, jokes. you can't be that. You can't, no, you can't be that arrogant. You can't be that stubborn. You can't yeah. be that foolish because the market will right away beat you up and, and, and smack you around. So if you don't know if you have any problems or you don't believe you have any problems, yeah. then just start trading and it will, ob it will very clearly make that a, uh, a prevalent part of your world and, and show you how wrong you are and teach you the hard way by making you lose a lot of money. I've always said to people, somebody who's brand new to this, if there's two things that you can avoid, number one, arrogance, number two, ignorance. They are the two things that the market punishes more than anything else. You know, arrogance, I can say it myself, the worst thing that happened to me earlier in my career is going on winning streaks. You know, just like, oh, I, everything I touch works great. I mean, and then guess what? Then you don't like it when you get a stop out. You don't like it when it goes wrong. So you force it. You know, that's a big second. And ignorance. And I'm, ignorance, unfortunately, you know, I think people hate that term. They say ignorance is a hard word. What ignorance really means, if you look at the definition, of it, is you don't know what you don't know. You know, and a lot of people don't know what they don't know. And so that bit, I think, is easy to overcome, isn't it? Because you can educate yourself. You can surround yourself by people who know what they're doing. But the, the, the arrogant side of it, always got to keep yourself in check. And it's easy to wobble. I'm sure as well, for me, I've wobbled when I've had losing streaks. But the problem is, if you start changing your plan during the losing streak, you then deviate from the plan that could give you a winning streak. Have you been through scenarios like that, Merlin? Absolutely, where you try to change midstream. I mean, there's these uh -huh. mantras in life that just translate right into uh, the trading world. Just don't change your horse midstream. Yeah, because you're going to drown. You know, finish what you're doing, get out of the trade, reassess the situation, and then build on build on your your lessons and what you've learned from that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's come back to bite me many times. So you have to come up with your strategy, your tactic. And to me, education is is key. I don't think I would be here today if it wasn't not just for my my primary education that I received in the trading world, but also being around other traders because a lot of times when we trade we're solo like here i'm trading from my house today you know I, i'm by myself now i'm disciplined enough to be able to do that and know if i'm making mistakes but people who are starting out who are relatively new when you start out you're making all these mistakes and you don't know you're making those mistakes you're doing it from home by yourself you have no one looking at what you're doing no one to bounce ideas off of and to me that that i guess hinders the development of anybody's trading life or career i think that it's a balance then though isn't it that you want to surround yourself by people who actually do know what they're doing rather than ones who don't so it's that thing of be selective with your friends so you want that community but you don't want a reddit community <laughs> you know yeah, you, right, don't, yeah. you want that like, right one and it's also about accountability as well i love the comments and questions coming in right now merlin a lot of people give some shoe shouts out to us we're doing on here brian hanover i know he's out in dubai uh phil jackson on here mark mcpherson side and harris pedro uh bob pellegrin lisa hightower francis stansfield uh heather cheney fantastic to see you guys muhammad also out in dubai as well uh lisa man here's another one i just saw on here Brian Duras, our own Brian Dimarisk, our student momentum coach on here as well. Peggy Jerome just said, Mike McMahon uh, told me that when you become a trader, you will meet a part of yourself you never knew you had, the dark side. That's great. I know Love Mike, it. I mean, Mike was, uh, Mike McMahon, I mean, many people probably wouldn't know, but Mike McMahon was like a mentor to you, obviously, right? You know, you work with over the years. It's the other or... way around. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you were mentor to him, right? You know? He, he took my class back Did in 1998. <laughs> <laughs> Did he really? Now, it just shows how much you've actually achieved, man. Because, I mean, like, wow, wow. I mean, he was like a mentor to me, you know, in my early yeah. years of my education. Well, let's be truthful. Well. He came in with trading experience. But in order to get on this trading floor that I was on in the late 90s, you had to take this class. They wanted you to understand the technology. And he didn't right. know this stuff. So ah. he sat through my class. It was kind of interesting when you look back. You know, he was, you know, the, the lead instructor for a long time. That's and, awesome. uh, yeah, he actually ended up taking my class the first time. It's We've been good friends. He's he's a great guy. He really is. And if he hit when you next speak to him, please send him my, my best as well. I mean, look, Merlin, I'll say thank you to you. You've been, you know, an instructor of mine over the years as well. And I remember when I first got into my trading education, you were all over the place and I was looking at it and, you know, there was a little bit of envy. Like, I want to be like him, you know, <laughs> as well. But respect, you know, and competition. Appreciate and I became it. an instructor. And then I was like, I want to be good like that guy. And then over the years, you know, we've just formed this wonderful friendship and I love it. And it's and it's been really, really so, so nice to do as well let me ask you this though uh and this is i think the question probably on, on on my mind when i talk to somebody with your caliber your level of experience has the trading has your day-to-day -day trading has the way you look at the market changed that much or has most of it kind of remained the same i would say the way that it's changed has been it's allowed me to become a little bit more passive for example 
um, I used to be much more entrenched and follow every single thing that happened and be consumed with sitting there watching these markets and, and just almost choking on information. You know, you're sitting there at midnight and all of a sudden you pull up your phone to see what's happening in these sessions and that session. I kind of pull back a little bit from that. And, and I, I really don't get so involved as much anymore. I obviously keep my feelers out there and I listen to different sites and things, but I don't feel like I'm as obsessed as I used to be. I can take right. a step back because a lot of my trades are going to be more swing in position, looking at things that go a couple of days to a couple of weeks. Um, you know, today I was day trading, which is kind of fun to do every now and again, but I don't do it every day anymore because, you know, I'm still building a lot of content and, and educating stuff and, and doing my own show, by the way. Yeah, nice yeah. to copy my show, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> there you but, um, but wait, wait, testament to you though, you do yours every day. I do mine once a week. Um, I'm just, I don't know how you do it. I really, really don't. So, so kudos to you in that, I will say. That, that's a tricky part. But yeah, um, you know, I, I think that the main thing that's changed has been just kind of my attitude and approach, which is take a step back and let the trades come to me and yeah. be a little bit more slow in my actions. Um, and, and try to enjoy life a little bit more. Unfortunately, this whole COVID BS just sucks and it we're does, all in the man. same boat. But as soon as we come out of it, you know, we'll do some more traveling and enjoy life because uh, the only thing that we can't give ourselves is more time and that clock is running. Absolutely, absolutely. It, and it's interesting because, you know, on the subject of time, I remember like early days of my trading, I'm always feeling like I'm missing out on something, you know, oh, I've got to get in now. I've got to get in now. And that does change. After time, you realize that missing out on one trade might lead you to an even better one as well. Yeah. Patience pays. Anyone looking at the show right now, I've always said they should rename this trading into waiting because that's what it really is all about. It's yeah. waiting more than anything else. Hopefully the tips are just a little bit better. Uh, Rob Pellegrin just saying, nice to see you again, Merlin. Obviously, they are loving it. It's, 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 it's just awesome having it. Um, before we go and take a look at some markets, I'd love to get your outlook on, on this as well. Um, what are your, a couple of questions for you. What are your favorite markets these days? I mean, do you, are you always, do you have a wider watch list or is it still kind of a focused watch list? And then you kind of find things that are at key points. And what's your kind of like, what do you like scouring for these days, buddy? Uh, with regards to short-term trading, it is a, it is a watch list, but it's simply just take the S&P 500 and whittle it down for things that have uh, act, active moves by ATR uh, and looking for liquidity, volume requirements. Other than that, you know, my short-term stuff, it's just that list. Yeah, I don't really limit myself to anything. You know, I'm trading Forex, I'm trading futures, I'm trading options, I'm trading equities, I'm trading cryptocurrencies. A, a lot of really with the cryptocurrencies now, I think is probably, I wouldn't say actively, but my my interest in holding and kind of position trading, swing trading those has been probably the, the biggest area because it's just been such a, um, a, a highly volatile and yeah. moving area. Yeah, and I and I finally started to take part in it as well. So, uh, but again, I'm doing it. I look at it like as an investment. I'm not trading it. You know, it's almost yeah. one of the things. To me, an investment is you, know, you can invest in real solid things or you can invest in unknown things. If you invest in something pretty solid, you know, if you go listen, in making an investment in Apple is not going to be a bad thing to do. You just want to get the best price. Making a long, long term investment in crypto does carry more risks, but there's also a ton more upside as well. So it's all about a balance, you know. And I think it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it, in any investment portfolio to have those more rigid you know safer because nothing's 100 percent you know sure. exposure and those things that are more like a punt i mean i look at my crypto exposure now as a little bit more of a punt you know but i think yeah. it's edging on the right side of things and i look at it literally as money i could afford to lose you know i don't expect to lose it but i could whereas other investments i'll say look i don't expect and i'll protect these a bit more aggressively i think it's all about having a bit of balance really isn't it so um absolutely absolutely pedro name respect to you both that's very very kind of you uh means a whole lot well let's go take a look i mean i'm gonna pull up some charts right now merlin uh i want to get into uh into this as well and i'd love to get kind of a little bit of now we're gonna do your call my put as well but we do okay. love a little bit of general we touched upon the dollar as well but i'd also be like to be looking at some general markets as well uh maybe the indexes so look we've got the main ones we look at i like to bring up the um i like to bring up the etfs so i've got the cues here uh we can look at the spiders and the dow um Let's just take a look on this. I'm going to get this into a daily chart. So what we've got on here is we have our, uh, let's get our weekly chart here in the middle. And we can look at our daily, our weekly. So I'm going to just zoom these in so we can see these a little bit clearer, Merlin. How are you feeling about the equities market? We've talked a lot about this, you know, on the show ourselves, and I've been on your show too. I mean, I still get a little kind of giddy when I look at the, the way that these things have been moving and the way that these things are, are actually going on here. When I look at that monthly chart of the NASDAQ, of the QQQ, it's like you want to be a part of it, but you don't want to be a part of it. You know, you want to be a part of it when it was, you know, down here. And that's fine. OK, 
But what would you say, you know, to a new investor? Because I tell you what, this whole Robin Hood generation now, everyone's a trader or everyone. Oh, yeah. Everyone thinks they're a trader. Let's put it that way. I've been doing this for, if you look back to 1996, I guess you could say I've been doing this for 24 years. I've been doing uh, power trading radio for 10 years. I've been doing Trader Merlin show for a year now. Yeah. I, I, I am fully immersed in the markets every single day. And some little jackass on 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 Reddit who's been trading for probably two months, who made a hundred percent rate of return on GameStop, has like two million followers. Oh, I, I know, like right? Five thousand. Hey, come on, man. Who are you gonna trust here? The guy's been doing this forever. Is some little schmuck who just got lucky. Now he's a genius. Ugh, well, I was gonna say that to you. And on this show, you can speak freely. I was gonna say that to you right before we do this because. You know, it's almost like I feel sometimes you do get punished for being the professional because you know that you could roll the dice and you could have a good run. But the simple fact of the matter is it's not always going to last as well. Yeah. And well, I'll be here and I'll be here in six months, 10 years, 15 years. And that kid won't. So well, there's, there's a difference between growing a career out of it. And there's a difference between having a punt on it. Yeah, that absolutely. aside, what do you feel? Um, but, you know, uh, Mahmoud was saying, what about Michael Berry? He was long GME as well. Hey, listen, I wonder what, I don't know what price he was long at as well. But, hey, you know, sometimes you can't beat them. You've got to join them as well. But I think the difference is, Mohammed, a guy like that knows that there are they aren't repeatable events, you know, knows when to do something like that and uh, as well, you know. But the thing I'd say about this uh, more than anything is what would you say, looking at these general markets that we're looking at here, like we've got our NASDAQ right now, 328.57 right now. Anyone who's looking to start investing in the market right now, what advice would you give them? Because to me, it's not a great time to be jumping in for the long term, right? I agree. I think, I mean, obviously you're buying all-time highs. I mean, you're, you're, you're one day off the all-time highs. So buying in right now is obviously pretty risky. But, uh, you know, as much as I, I am a, internally a bear here, and I think these markets are going to come crashing down, you cannot argue this trend right now. So you, you really just have to say, all right, where do I want to buy into it? And I think that's where you look for your demand zones, you look for your, you know, uh, support levels, or you want to call them, and say, these are points where I'm looking to buy into this uptrend. Now, the key here, I think, for anybody who's looking to join that trend, and, and you look at that chart Sam's drawing, if you tell me that's going down, you, you must be standing on your head or something. That is going up, and it's going up strongly well, for of course, years. Yeah. I mean, no so, one can deny that, can they? That is an No one can trend. deny that. And if you do, then you shouldn't be trading whatsoever. But the bottom line here is when you look at a picture like this, you, um, you want to be a part of it, but you have to kind of ask yourself, where do I join in that trend? Also, that, that's step number one. Step number two, which is probably more important, which says, if I am proven wrong, meaning that trend is broken and starts to make some new lows, mm -hmm. you have to get out of that position. Because I think when the, when the sell-off comes, it's going to be pretty extended. I think it's going to be a, a pretty uh, lengthy sell-off here in the equity markets. But it's not happening yet, so keep riding that trend to the upside. As much as it's, you're in disbelief, keep buying and again, you can see it. it's constantly from a technical perspective, been holding, been holding, been holding. And I've always said this again, you've been in this a long time. Ago. There's always the people who want to be a hero. They want to call the top of the market. I tell you, I've been a boring SOB over the last two years. I've just been saying, hey, I know it's all going to fall, the, the, the bottom's going to fall out of it, but I'm not seeing the signs yet. So just buy the pullbacks, buy the pullbacks, buy the pullbacks. Any of my students on the show right now, listen, so all I've been doing since I said, just buy the pullbacks, buy the pullbacks, buy the pullbacks. I don't want to be a hero. I want to just get paid, right? <laughs> I don't want to be the hero. I said, hey, I called the top of the market and I made an incredible return, but I just broke even because I lost all my money shorting it on the way up, right? I think hey, that has I, I pulled the hero trade last year. Yeah, you did. There you oh, go. Yeah. There you go. In April, in April, I was building a short position because I actually thought we were going to have a, a, a double dip, a second run down. Yeah. And it was one of those ones, I'm like you. You know, I want to be the consistent one. And I said, you know what? This is the flyer. Go for it. I ended up with 480 puts on the S&P. Wow. <laughs> oh, that oh. trade didn't work out. It was a pretty big loser. But, but the amount that I, I, I set aside a pretty large amount of capital for that and I said, hey, if I lose this, uh, actually, I had a specific date that I was going to get out of the trade. Um, but I told myself, you know, here's the amount I'm willing to lose on this trade. And unfortunately, you know, we almost hit max loss in that trade. But it's one of those things where I had my plan. I followed what I said I was going to do, even though I knew uh, it was a it was a long shot and it didn't pan out. But hopefully the next time this thing drops, I'll be in 480 puts as well. And it'll be a totally different story. That's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, if you've just tuned into the show right now and before we go back over to the charts and, and, and heard what Merlin just said, there he is uh, openly talking you know, about it. Respect, because 
that's when you know you've got a trader. When somebody's actually been doing this, is happy to talk about their losses as well as their gains. I'm just putting that out there right now. Respect to that because losing Thanks. is part of this. It is part of it. It will always be part of it. And that's the thing, you know. It's People have to understand that. So respect to you for saying that. I want to just make that point, guys. Listen to that point very carefully. That, And I've heard on the show many times when you talk about your wins and your losses, Merlin. Um, I think in this case here is you buy the pullbacks, you go with it, but you protect those profits. That's my big advice to anybody right now. You wait for a pullback. And when we're talking about a pullback, guys, we're waiting for those dips to just ride it higher. But we want to protect, protect, protect as we go and not give it all back. Mohammed was just saying news just come out that the Wall Street Bets founder sold his story to Hollywood and Brett Ratner. And here's the point I will make. Somebody out of a GameStop event will make a ton of money. Oh, yeah. I'm not denying that. There is money to be made, but that one or two percent in that group who make a ton of money like that, but and good luck to them. Good luck to them, right? You know they've been opportunities they've got. It's the rest of the people I worry about. It's the other ninety nine percent of people who jump on the bandwagon and get crushed. That's who I'm appealing to right now. That's who we're talking about. Not the guy who started the fire, but the one who get they they, they left the building long ago. It's the people who run into the burning building and get burnt to death, right? That's who you have to be careful with. Jeff, let me add two cents to that one. So just for viewers that are watching this right now, if you have somebody who's telling you about GameStop and how great it is and how these guys have changed the markets, I want to put something in perspective. Robinhood sells their order flow to a company called Citadel. Citadel is in bed with all sorts of other major firms. So what happened in Citadel actually paid a fine of $700,000 for front running client order flow, meaning those orders that come through from Robinhood, they would hold those if there was a big block of shares to buy one particular symbol. Citadel would buy it for themselves and drive those shares, those shares would drive the price up. What's interesting here is if you look at these three participants, Robinhood, Citadel, and Melvin Capital, who's one of the firms that got really hosed in this whole short squeeze thing. Melvin Capital was short GameStop at 20 bucks, right? They're shorting at 20 bucks. They were thinking from 20, it's gonna go even lower. What do you think they're thinking when it's at 380 or 400 bucks per share? Right. They're loving to short at 380 480 bucks per share. Citadel just gave two billion dollars to melvin capital so you have the retail robin hood guys thinking they've changed the world you have citadel who just put two billion dollars backing the big guy who's going to short the hell out of gamestop yet again at four hundred dollars <laughs> it's it's horrible because it's the classic story of financial markets the big guy luring in the little guy baiting them in and they baited them in by thinking you're all going to get rich off these short squeezes just follow Wall Street bets. And I'm, I'm a hedge fund right now going, <laughs> <laughs> sell everything. I'm crushing you. So I, I almost feel bad for him, but it goes back to what you talked about. Education, understand how markets work. I mean, it, it, it's mind boggling listening to these experts right now on Reddit and GameStop. Yeah. Drive me nuts. Well, and then it's all about a game of longevity in the long run as well. So, yep. buying the boys. One final question on this, and then I'll do, let's do our your call, my puts. Let's go back over to the charts right now. Uh, give me one to look at. S&P, it could be S&P, it could be Dow. What would be a sign for you that the tide is changing, that we are getting some downward pressure? Because I always look for like those bigger, you know, technical levels. You're going to look at longer term charts, weekly, monthly. What would you want me to look at here, Merlin? Um, you know, it's. It, I know that you like to look at the at the, at the the weeklies and monthlies. I, I tend to start with the dailies. I know okay. that. That's like my big time frame. It's mm -hmm. just what I've worked with for years. Um, right now, if you look at that NASDAQ 100, my, my video is right over the low that I'm going to point out here. But it's that low that happened uh, just a couple days ago on the 29th of January. That low is at uh, 312.76. Yep. You know, to me, that's the first sign. If we can get below that low right there, yeah, the little area, and just start to get a close below that, then all of a sudden I'm saying, okay, I'm not convinced it's going to tank. But at least we're starting to make new lows. And that's the first sign that the sellers are starting to win the battle against the buyers. Right. Yes, it's happened before, but it doesn't happen too often. So once we get below there, maybe I'll go neutral on, on my long positions and start looking for potential short candidates or maybe in short the indexes. Um, what will probably happen is we'll break below that level, retest back up. If that holds, then I'm going to start to really pile into a position. And it can be something as simple as big round numbers, like 300. I mean, like let's just keep it as simple as that. Psychology, numbers, they are literally... <sighs> Simple, simple, simple stuff. We have to get a real sign. And at the moment, yes. guys, look at the chart. It ain't going down. So don't be the hero. Go with it. But my two <laughs> rules are be wait for a pullback, get long on a pullback, and protect those profits. Don't give them all back. I would just say to anybody looking at the show right now, if they're here with me and listen to Merlin, my own take on anything I do here on the long or the short side is I'm just smart about my profit taking. I mean, that's it, you know, because... You know, you're still in the very late stages of a trend. Historically, in the longest bull market we've seen for, for probably ever, 
we have to just be smart about this. That's all it yeah, really absolutely. is at the end of the yep. day. Wonderful, wonderful. So it's come to that time in the show. My God, this show could go on and on and on. And I just love talking to you about it as well. But we always do uh, your call, my put. So something for the for the for the guys to look out on here. What you're bullish on? Uh, something you're bearish on? I always like to give my guests the uh, give the choice. If you're not sure what I mean by terminology, if I buy a call, I'm bullish. If I buy a put, I'm bearish. So you're calling my put. Are you a bull? Are you a bear? What you wanted me to look at? Give me a give me a one today, Merlin. Uh, okay, let, let me refine it down. First off, before we do that, I want to give a big shout out to Pedro here. I know he's going through some pretty hard times. So Pedro, I hope you're feeling better, my friend. I know it's a a, a tough slog for you, but uh, we're, we're we're pulling for you. Um, what what time frame are we thinking about here? Are you are you talking long term? Are we talking? Yeah, swing? Less, less, I mean, nothing less than nothing less than nothing less than a daily chart. Nothing less than a daily chart. Something you're seeing happening in the next you know week or two. Let's call it a swing trade, okay? Swing position. What do you what, what do you fancy? All right, I'm gonna um let me let me bring up a chart on my side just so I can see here. Um, Go for it. I, I'm not liking where it's at right now, but over I would say the next six months, mm -hmm. I'm actually bearish. So I'll start with the bearish Good side man. and get the positive side. Um, and, and there's a bunch, we could go back and forth. I got a whole bunch I could talk about, but um, I'm bearish on Facebook. I, I know it, it technically the levels just, they're not really anything strong there, but I think if you get down below that, uh, that 240 mark, probably a little bit higher than that, uh, 245, if we can get a close down below that, I think you're gonna start to see Facebook drift down. I know that they're receiving a lot of heat from regulators. You're getting that's max. And so they because... should, by the way. So they What's should. That? So they should get that heat, I think as well. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on with your data that it's, they're not really open about, you know. And it's no, not me hating not. on I Facebook. Mean, but look, but... We, we, look, I only use it to talk about my show. I, I don't put personal well, me stuff too, on yeah. there anymore. I mean, it, it, it's all just become super political. And if you watch, if you want to watch something good, watch, um, oh, what's that movie? The Social Dilemma, I believe. Oh, yeah, it's, it's on, on Netflix. Netflix. It's a great, great, Excellent. very good. Awesome, awesome. Social Dilemma, awesome, awesome. It, it almost scares you a little bit because it's a, they're manipulating people to become radicals and, and, and unintentionally, but just what happens because they're feeding you what you want to read. So if you start reading that a uh, website that says, you know, Trump sucks, then all of a sudden you're going to get all the stuff is fed to you that right. says Trump sucks, and all of a sudden now you're just a radical that thinks she's going to kill him. Oh, come on, guys. We're all human beings here. Anyway, um, I think Facebook is going to start to get some heat from regulators. What I don't like is how the markets, specifically the NASDAQ, has been making higher highs, all-time highs. And if you look over the past few months, since August, Facebook has just been traversing sideways. So I'm kind of waiting for the breaking point when you start to see the earnings numbers, the ad revenue uh, might be the next. Uh, they actually just reported. And it is one of the. Week. You know, it's an interesting analysis you say there because it is one of the big boys, and you can really see it on this weekly chart swing lows. You know, lower lows, lower highs. When you look at the power of the QQQs, it's just been like every pullback it's had, bam, new highs. Pullback, bam, new highs. That's what happened. We have not seen the same thing on Facebook. There's right. definitely there's definitely a weakness in there. This, to me, if I just look at it on this period here, it's like just looks like a little bit of distribution going on at the right. higher levels here as well. What scares me for them is all this wide open space below here exactly. as well. There's a ton of wide open space. On the side, I love it, Merlin. I, I, I like that play. I do. Uh, have you got, would, now this is something, would you like to get a better entry on it for a short position? What would be your play on something like this? Would you like to do the options on it or, you know, take an outright short position on this? Uh, I'm I'm not going to do an outright short position just no. because the capital required. I mean, exactly. when, when, for me, when I find these setups, uh, I'm basing them on the underlier, obviously Facebook's chart, but I'd be looking at the option market for sure. Exactly, and we record that all the time as well. Stock replacement strategy, guys, especially with prices at this, you know, buying puts, buying calls. In fact, you know, that's one of the things I really do, ir irrespective of volatility, believe it on Merlin. I very rarely sell options. I just buy them. I just have a strategy to get the best way I can get the premiums on there as well. Uh, yeah. I agree, best use of your capital as well for a less... Less risk as well to sure. You, you know, have to find risk. You know, oh, yeah. if I'm buying puts, I know my maximum risk is what I paid for that option. Exactly. And I think especially for people starting out, that's probably the biggest cost to learning is taking losses. And, and a lot of people, they'll blow their accounts by not taking the loss. So exactly. options are great because it limits it. I love it. A put option to me is like buying car insurance for a car that you don't own and that car gets written off and you get paid for it. It's a wonderful <laughs> thing. So, uh, okay. you know, to put it in the layman's terms. Funny enough, I'd like to get your opinion on this because on the show over the coming month, like recent months, I've been pretty bearish on Zoom, as you know, as well. I think I said yeah, this on too. your last show as well. Uh, yeah, I'm still seeing that weakness on the weekly charts. Yeah, we've had a slightly better month, but... 
Not all that to me. I think that that is one that could go with it. Again, see how it's pulling very much against the overall tech sector as well. Yeah. And I'm just seeing weakness on that. So for me, this has actually just been testing the $400 mark. So the $400 mark for me is quite key on this. Uh, this has actually been the area right across here, just on 400, where I was looking to kind of like see that turn in the market. So, so for me too, if we can't get back over 400, I think a little bit more downside. And again, looking to around the 250 mark really, and then possibly even lower. Uh, on Zoom on that one as well. So totally agree. I think Zoom Zoom is is headed to much lower levels. I mean, how can you compete with companies that have the pockets of Facebook, Google, Amazon? I mean, all these companies could squash them right away. I to me, Zoom is done. It is and a great. I mean, I like their technology. I like their interface. It's good, but there's got to be something in there that they got to step up and they got to do as well. I don't think it's going to be going anywhere as a business, but I certainly don't think that their shareholders are going to be as happy as they have been over the last couple of months necessarily. Yeah. So you've left me with uh, the, the 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 bullishness on here as well uh, to see. Uh, you know what? It, I'm kind of bullish on everything. You know, I have been overall in the, on the on the broad market itself. But I'm going to just bring it up right now. And, and, I, and I keep bringing this one up. And I don't think it's done yet. But I'm, I, it's still going up. But I'm bullish on crude still. i got to say, I have been yeah. bullish on crude for a long time. I was bullish on it when it was way down here at six bucks. Okay. I know on your show, I've been bullish on it. I've been looking at systematic areas. I would say this right now. We are finally coming into an area. And let's just zoom in. And hopefully you can see this as well. We're coming into an area finally where it is. But what I love about it, which has been a real tell for me, Merlin, which has made me a little bit more bullish, is we breezed right through some resistance right there in that particular point. Yep. And I don't see anything till deeper. I mean, for me, that that this chart here is really where it's at right now on this monthly chart. Uh, I'm looking probably around like this whole cluster here. I got to say 60, 65. I've been saying it. I just can't get relatively bearish on it until we hit that $60 mark. And then when we do, the stair stepping, I just feel in this market that what this needs more than anything right now uh, is more of a pullback to then just looking for it. And I've got to say, if this thing kind of gets back to about $45, which I'm not even sure if it will anytime soon, that's a buy for me as well. I would say while I'm bullish on it at the moment, I'm not jumping into it right now. I had a just big gap up again today as well. I think in the short term, I expect this area here to be holding quite nicely for some short-term pullbacks. That would be my aggressive play on this. But i got to say, I'm still I'm sniffing 60, 65 bucks on this, Merlin. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Totally agree. A hundred percent with you. It's it's funny because I think people who, who pay attention to the normal dynamics of markets are going, how can you say that crude oil is going to keep going up when the dollar is going to be going up? That should be inverse relationship there. Yeah. Here's the issue. The issue is we have a brand new presidential administration who's made it very clear that they're looking to alternative energy and going to start clamping down on these the easing that Trump did for fossil fuels. So yep. we're going to see crackdowns on fracking. We're going to see crackdowns on the pipelines and, and a push towards alternative energy. That in turn is just simply going to drive, it's going to decrease supply. Demand for all intents and purposes will remain the same for now until we get move on. But yeah, I think that that's going to be a, a, a the big catalyst, which is what's been driving crude oil and can it continue to drive it for the next year or so. And again, let's also think about this as much as there's going to be, you know, renewal in, you know, investment in clean energy. And I'm all for that as well. It's not like suddenly, you know, fleets of like FedEx and UPS yeah. and all these companies say, all right, all right, and Amazon now with their delivery are all going to go elect electric and not require like we're in a world. Right? Think about real basic stuff. There's still a demand for fossil fuels while most of the world's running on fossil fuels. And now yeah. we're in a world where everything's delivery, 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 home delivery. But it's just basics, right? And again, I see it as a little bit of a hedge play as well, just in case, because it wouldn't be the first time an administration said it's going to do one thing and then does completely the other. So, you know, for me, I, I see it, the charts there. I'm not saying we're going to be knocking on the door of 75 or 100 anytime soon, but short term play 60, 65. Thank you, Merlin, for that. Merlin, this has been let, an let me throw one more at you, Sam. Go I know you probably want to go and do that stuff. But let me throw one more at you, because this is the my call, your put, or your put, my call, whatever it is. Um, I'm going to do a double because you have one of each on this one. And it, it's something it's not normally talked about. It's Ethereum, it's cryptocurrency, right? Okay. So what's interesting is we have Bitcoin futures. And when Bitcoin futures came out years ago, it crashed Bitcoin. Bitcoin went from 20,000, dropped all the way down to yes. 3,000 over the next couple of years. And it, it largely was thought because that was the futures market. Now, I am wildly bullish on Ethereum 
long term. We're talking five, ten years. I think Ethereum is going to just dominate the marketplace, trillion dollar market cap plus. Now, um, futures on Ethereum start trading February 8th. So we're just a couple days away from Ethereum future contracts being rolled out. I think you have a great short opportunity here in Ethereum. I have a feeling this is the same bull run that happened in Bitcoin and it's yep. happening right now with Ethereum and all of a sudden futures are coming out. So I have a feeling you're going to see a pretty significant drop in Ethereum. I don't want it because it's one of my major holdings. Mm -hmm. However, I'll keep it. Um, but I do think that it will give you a buying opportunity for a long-term hold in Ethereum, yeah. which will pan out dividends. Anyway, and I see one. some real nice open imbalances oh. down here. <laughs> I mean, like some lovely like pullback areas there. You heard it here first, guys, Merlin talking about Ethereum. And, I, and you know me, like I've decided to invest in mine in, in an ETF, in like a crypto in ETF that includes a bit of Ethereum and to hedge against a little bit of all of that as well. So like anything, you know, it needs that pullback. But you know, that to me looks like a fair buy uh, on the downside as well. Not oh, if one... it gets to 700, I'm, I'm buying a lot yeah. more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that. That is on my watch. It's ELX on there. I've got the liquid index on that. Taking a look at that. What an absolute blast. Guy, man, this has been an absolutely fun show. What's the rest of it? It's Thursday today, Merlin. Uh, what's the rest of the week look like for you, my friend? Uh, you know me, just trading, working on content. Of course, I do my show every day at 2 p.m. Pacific time. You can see that on YouTube at Trader Merlin is the name of the show. Um, you know, that's usually my thing. Just, just doing live stuff every day. Well, I love lovely. It. Well, lovely. We, really, I get the, I see your joy. I see how much you like doing this. This is fun. I wish, day? I wish I had time to do it every day, but being CEO of a company's kind of tough, but you know, and I mean, recording content creation, as you know, I'm doing it myself as well for our students yeah. doing live trading sessions. We were doing that yesterday as well. Lots going on too, but yeah, we're actually going to be having probably a little bit of an online expo. Uh, Take Stock, guys, if you know, Take Stock Live is brought to you and powered by stockability.com and we're going to have a live expo coming up next month, which I'd love you to maybe kind of join me on for a little bit as well. And uh, I'm sure some of the guys would appreciate that. We're doing a trade a expo one day as well, which would be a really, and maybe a bit of an investathon. It might be a little bit of both as well. We don't Right. Include Sounds the, good. I like, you know, we, trading and investing go hand in hand, and people don't know the difference between the two enough. So we're going to be working a little bit on that. So I'd love it if you could join us next month on that. And I promise, when you're ready for me, I'll be back on your show uh, in the next couple of weeks as well. You're always welcome, man. Thank you, sir. This has been one of the most fun I've had for a long time. Ladies, thank you so much, Merlin. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Merlin Rothfeld, my guest on the show for today as well. Uh, what an absolute blast. I mean, I just absolutely just love that, having him on the show. And uh, he's definitely coming back. Uh, you can see why he and I get on uh, so well as well. Guys, if you are also interested in finding out a little bit more about what we get up to uh, at stockability.com, which is what powers and brings you Take Stock Live, uh, I'm going to say, hey, sis, we've got a couple of great new webinars coming. Let me just go and quickly share the thing with you head on over after this show to stockability.com on the website you can see scroll on down uh, to the bottom of the page and we've got some new complimentary webinars coming up right now it's three on the calendar for this month as well let's zoom in first is trading versus investing which one is right for you uh, that's going to be on when this coming wednesday the 10th of february at 3 eastern then the trading business blueprint on thursday 25th and then finally understanding how the market really works expanding a lot about what merlin and i were just talking about uh, on the show today would love it if you guys could join us on there go ahead and register as well uh see some of you guys in there see what we're all about and what we actually get up to uh, at stockability.com love to see you there uh my fellow um uh my, my fellow co-founders and partners dan buster martin myself ryan watkins will all be on there and maybe some extra special guests too we're in the business to help so please check it out as well as we go man what a show it's been an absolute blast if you have been in the show live thank you so much pedro louise bob mark brian everybody saeed Gloria, everyone on here, what a record turnout. I'm not going to put it down to me. I'm going to put it down to Merlin. But what a record turnout today. This has been great. And if you are looking at the recording of this show, you might have caught it on the Facebook Live channel where all of the recordings are. And also, please check out the Stockability YouTube channel as well if you've not yet done so, where you'll see more content from our team, from our instructors, and also previous uh, shows uh, in Take Stock Live as well. Guys, I've been Sam Evans, or I still am Sam Evans. This has been Take Stock Live. It's Thursday, February 4th, just gone 1 p.m. here on the East Coast. Stay warm, stay safe, wrap yourself up, spend a lot of good time with the family, enjoy those markets. I will see you next week at the same time. Thanks so much. Yeah.